If you know that it's mighty, come on and give God the praise. Come on, right where you are. If you know that it's mighty, I want you to start typing on the line. You become the quiet and say, He's mighty. He's mighty. He's mighty. He's mighty. and sing with us. Everybody, he's mighty. I see you singing. I see you singing. That's it. Come on and say it. He's mighty, mighty, mighty. Yeah. He's mighty. I love our choir. I see you online singing right now. Come on. We got one more round. Big. Come on. Here we go. He's mighty. He's mighty! He's mighty! He's mighty! Hey! He's mighty! He's mighty! He's mighty! He's a mighty God! Yes, he is! He's a mighty God! Yes, he is! He's a mighty God! Yes, he is. 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 Like I know, he's so mighty. I don't know. Glory to God. He's a mighty God. And I tell you, we serve such a mighty God. And we have also a mighty leader. Bishop Jakes has put together such an amazing conference many of us thousands across the world watched this woman thou art loose the very first virtual conference and when I tell you it was nothing short of amazing the speakers Christine Kane Pastor Cheryl Brady I almost fell out of my couch listening to her preach under the anointing of the Holy Ghost and of course a bishop himself, who always rocks the world. Such an incredible meeting. And when I watched the morning coffee, Pastor Sarah and Pastor Marissa Farrell, it was amazing. I was completely blessed. Pastor Shira, I was completely blessed sitting, watching, drinking water, looking at the women of God, discussing faith, hope, and love. I don't know about you, but we should all give our visionary a wonderful round of applause for putting together something like this at such a high level. And what we want to do is we want to give you a recap of what took place over the last few days. Now, my sisters, queens from all over the world, I command you to birth your dreams and your visions and those things that seem impossible. Possible, possible. I have come to learn that it is not your beauty that makes you great, it's your beast. Our world needs divine intervention. We need a revival. You are free. Your voice is free, and it's important. 
you certainly get bruised in this job, but I also still have such pride for what I do and who I am as a person. We got to think about this for the long term because there is no going back to the way things used to be. Used to be. You are called to a ministry. A ministry. A ministry. I felt depleted. I felt depressed. I felt defeated. But I still believe God. You've got the story. You've got the testimony. We need you. We know God is here. I walked in the building this evening and I felt the presence of God. I want to give you permission to know that when you are at the end of your rope, that is when God's unexpected hope kicks in. It's all right to be hurt, but to be hurt 30 years is to be stuck. And you've got to go, because you have an appointment with destiny. 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 And for a limited time only, you can watch all the main stage sessions on Bishop's YouTube channel, youtube.com, TD Jakes Official. And beginning Wednesday, October 21st, stream the entire Woman Thou Art Loose virtual experience exclusively on Bishop's Village. What an amazing encounter, and I'm certainly glad to be a part of a ministry that moves all over the world like this, and I'm sure you all as well. I want to call your attention to Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4, verse 24 and 26. And it came to pass by the way in the end that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at his feet and said, Surely a bloody husband art thou to me. So we let him go. Then she said, a bloody husband thou art because of the circumcision. Father, we thank you for your word. Let it touch somebody, heal somebody, deliver in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to talk to you today from the subject, it's in your hands. This all began with a young man named Midian, and his name meant strife, and strife is simply conflict or bitter disagreement. And Midian was one of six sons from Abraham and his wife Keturah, and this was the second wife after Sarah had passed. Now, I think it's noteworthy for you to get when we start talking about strife or start talking about conflict. He himself was not a conflict. He was not what he was called, but he was born into one. And when we deal with conflicts, we normally fall into one to four categories. Conflict with self, or conflict with others, a conflict with the environment, and a conflict with the supernatural. But what do you do when you're born into conflict? How do you maneuver when you didn't put yourself in the place of opposition or the place of disagreement? He was born into conflict, but he was not a conflict. And I want to park there before I move any further because I want to tell you, you are not a conflict. You may be in a conflict. You may have conflict with yourself. You may have conflict with your environment. You may have conflict with the supernatural. You may have conflict with somebody else. But you 
are not a conflict. So Joe, what do I do when I find myself in a conflict? Well, the first thing you gotta do is find the contrast in the conflict. If you can find the contrast, the contrast simply means if you were to juxtapose that you were completely opposite of that conflict. Find that contrast, live from that contrast, and be different because you can. You don't have to be what people call you, and you don't have to create a culture and create a context of that conflict. What you can do is create your own culture that you have juxtaposed or contrasted. I am not a conflict. I want you to write that down right now as a confession that I am not a conflict. I've got to find the contrast. I've got to be completely opposite of what people are calling me. I've got to be completely, completely opposite of when I've allowed what people to call me to internalize within me. I've got to find the contrast. I've got to learn how to dig within who I am and pull out the treasure that God placed within me. Because here's the kicker. The power to be you is already in you. And all the conflict does is give you opportunity. An opportunity to change a marker set by society. And to create a nutrient that proves the contrast is achievable. So you can be what you want to be in the face of naysayers and in the face of people that said you don't have a chance. Matter of fact, I believe there's at least a couple of thousand of you right now that are the contrast of the conflict. You turned out completely different than what people said you were going to be. You are walking a completely different walk than what people said you were going to walk. You have a completely different career than what people said you were going to have. You are the contrast, and you found it. Now your job is to help somebody else figure out how to find the contrast in the conflict. See, it was a conflict for Median and his, and his, and his five brothers, Zimran, Joksas, Medan, Ishbak, and Shua, to settle in the same areas that have brother Isaac. For Isaac was the promised child. Median was born into conflict. He and his brothers had to move away just like their half-brother Ishmael. For the Bible says that Abraham sent them off with gifts. Just because you send me with a gift don't mean I'm glad to leave. But he sent him off with a gift. It was customary. He sent him off with a gift because there was an understanding. I am not the promised child. So he sent him off with a gift and they go east towards Moab and settle south of Canaan. And they encompass themselves in the desert east of Sinai by Horeb. Over time, his descendants become one of the nations in our text that we're talking about called the Midianites. They were a nomadic tribe of merchants that settled in an open trade area. And that route extended to Egypt. Now, here's what's critical about that route. It was this route that reconnected the two nations. Just like Jesus is the route or the way that is called the way that connects two realms. So this route was more than just a getaway for Moses. Because where we are in the text, Moses is getting away. And while he's getting away, he's on this route headed to Midian. And while he's there, I couldn't help but to see through Revelation that this was more than just a getaway. It was more than just a route, but it was a, what I would call a rites of passage. A rites of passage, a rites of passage involves what you would call ritual activities and teachings that are designed to strip you of the role and the way that you came and to prepare you for the new role and the new way. So while he's running, he's running away from what he's been labeled. He's running away from the conflict and he's finding the contrast. He's on the way to discover who he is because on his departure, he discovered that something's different about him. He's searching for the contrast. This passage, this route taken by Moses as he flees Egypt after seeing one of his people brutally beaten by one of the soldiers. And when he finds out that Pharaoh possibly knows that he just buried 
buried or killed an Egyptian soldier, Pharaoh gets furious and Moses becomes fearful. He hid the man in the sand. And when I started thinking about that, it dawned on me that all of us have hid some things in the sand. Every one of us have buried some stuff in the sand. Every one of us have been caught if we didn't physically do something, we emotionally did something, or we spiritually did something, or psychologically did something, and after we got done with it, we buried it because we were not happy with ourselves, and it's in the sand. I'm not here to ask you what have you buried, but I want you to know that the thing you buried shows you that you are not the conflict, but it created a conflict. And he had to find the contrast. His anger raised within him because he saw one of his own being beaten and he strikes him and he takes off running. But then I also found out that not only he buried things in the sand and not only did I bury things in the sand, but somebody else buried things in the sand. The Bible says that man was shaped from the dust of the earth. And out of the dust of the earth, then God blew, glory to God. He blew the breath of life into the sand. You are what God buried in the sand. My God. The Bible says, for we have this earthen treasure, for we have this treasure buried in earthen vessels. All of us have a gift that has been buried in the sand. Moses, he leaves Egypt dressed like an Egyptian, but he runs in fear. And I couldn't help but wonder. He ran because he believed Pharaoh was going to kill him. And I wondered, how fast did he run? Because every time I tried to research the distance, the distance supposedly was 215 hours if you were driving 50 kilometers. How did he get that? How did this man acquire this kind of strength to get that far? And then I began to realize, did he run like some of us looking back? Because all of us have a tendency to run and look back when we know we've buried our past in the sand. And he's running and he's running and he's running. And I'm trying to figure out what is going through Moses' mind as he runs. Did he know that Midian would just be there? Did he stop because he was tired? Did he stop because he was tired of running and he wanted something to drink? Because you can only go so long on the strength that you have before you have to stop and recover from what you're dealing with. And many of you now, you didn't stop on purpose, you collapsed. You collapsed because you got tired of running and didn't see anybody there to help you. And you, if no one saves you, you will be the one buried in the sand. Did he decide to stop and get help? What did he do? But what I found out, that where you stop, glory to God. And I want you to write this down on the line. Where you decide to stop can either help you or hurt you. Where you decide to stop can either break you or make you. Now allow me to park Moses right here. Because the text tells us that Moses ran to Midian and then he sits at a well. He sits at a well and he runs into the priest of Midian, the daughters, seven daughters. So I want to leave him there because what I need to also do is go find out What happened where he came from? Because on the other hand, Abraham, who was the father of many nations, is the same man that fathered Median, that fathered Isaac. They had different mothers at different times, Keturah and Sarah. Twelve sons are born from Jacob. Twelve tribes eventually form the Hebrew nation. 
What started out as a family in Egypt by way of Joseph and Isaac grew and increased and multiplied, became fruitful and grew in strength. And in the process of time in Egypt, there was a new king that popped on the scene who had no relationship with that family. And he began to see them as a threat. And when he saw them as a threat, he put the pressure on him. Glory to God. And he imposed fear into them to control them. He put taskmasters on them. And he dealt shrewdly with them. And he began to afflict them with heavy burdens. And he made them build store cities. And he began to press them. But what got me in the text is that every time he pressed them, they grew. Every time he pressed them, they multiplied. Every time he pressed them, they grew. Every time he pressed them, they grew. Every time he pressed them, they multiplied. I'll say it again. Every time he pressed them, they grew. Every time he pressed them, they multiply. When you feel pressed, you've got to recognize it is a time and a season for you to grow. I cannot crack under the hands of this pressure. Glory to God. Many times we don't detect God's hand because of the pain from man's hand. And the truth wasn't pretty. Because they were getting pressed, but God was still blessing. I came on here to encourage you. You've got to find the contrast in the conflict. When you feel like you're being pressed, flatlined, broken, you have to find the contrast. You have to seek God. You have to go after the greater one. You have to go inside and realize what he put inside of you. This is not a time for you to fold your tent, but this is the time for you to recognize that the only reason why the enemy is pressing me in the first place because he has recognized that I am a threat to his territory. You've got to wake up and know that there is a reason for the press on your life. He's pressing you because of what you can become, but he doesn't understand that his pressing is helping you become. His pressing is pushing you. His pressing is taking you. I wish I had a witness in here. If you were in this place right now, I'd tell you, shout hallelujah! Glory to God. God had told Abraham before he died that his descendants would be sojourners. A sojourner is simply someone that's in a temporary location, and he told them they would be there for 400 years. So it was not surprising, 400 years of opposition and oppression. It doesn't sound temporary. It sounds like an eternity. Especially when generations are multiplying and, and increasing. And though it was a long time, it was still temporary in location. But what was happening internally was having an everlasting effect in their thoughts, in their imagination, and in their beliefs. Because see, here's what happens. You can be in a place in and out and in and out. And the results of your in and out will cause what you were in to stay in emotionally. And now you will take some counseling and some surgery to deal with what you were in and out of. But I came on here today to tell you, God's getting ready to do something for you right now. It ain't happening tomorrow, but we're decreeing and declaring right now that God's about to do surgery in your mind. Somebody shout in your house right now. Glory to God. Psalms 34, 18 says, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Now, here's interesting to me. Moses is raised by the people. His people are serving like slaves. He too was born in a conflict. He was in a conflict. He wasn't what they called him. He was raised and educated and adorned as an Egyptian. But he was a Hebrew through and through. You are not a conflict. You just have one. There isn't a person on the planet that has not had to deal with some form of conflict. See Moses as he's running. Yeah, I'm back to him now. He's on the path. 
He's on the route, the rites of passage. What change is getting ready to happen? Leads him to Median, and he stops at the well. Oh, my God, this is a shadow of Jesus meeting the woman at the well. When you seek God at the well, you always see change. When you seek God at water, you always see change. When we seek God at water, Moses is being drawn out of water by Pharaoh's daughter. And now he's at the well, about to be drawn out by Egyptian influence. Can I say that again? He's at a well where Egyptian influence is going to be drawn from him. He's been running with the conflict, but now he's at a well... Well, the influence is now going to be drawn out of his life. And over the next few years, it would be easy for me right now to talk about the fight that Moses had with the shepherds at the well. It would be easy to talk about how God revealed himself to Moses at the burning bush, all that happened on this rites of passage. It would be easy to see and talk to you about what God told him, take off of your, take your shoes off because you're standing on holy ground. It would be easy to talk about the signs that God gave him when he told him. He said, Lord, what am I going to do when I tell them who sent me? And when I tell them that I've had an appearance from you, he said, stick your hand in your bosom. Pulled his hand out and it was white as leprosy. Then he stuck it back in it returned. Then he said, listen, what I want you to do is scoop some water out. And then I want you to put it on the ground and it's going to turn to blood. And then he said, I want you to throw your staff down. He threw a staff down and it turned into a snake. And then he reached down and he picked it back up. He said, these are signs that you can show them. And you can also tell them, tell them that I am sent you. All of that is powerful. And all of that is supernatural. But it ain't what I want to talk about. I want to talk about that woman that was back east from Midian named Zipporah. Glory to God. Her name meant small bird or sparrow. And the root of her word is an Arabic verb signifying to chirp. And it is said in the rabbinical teachings that she exemplified a bird. As in when her father, Jethro, asked her, where was the man that helped you at the well? And the Bible says that she flew out to find him and flew back. This is all a description, symbolism of the bird, which I had a witness. And then we will see her stepping back in and bringing him for dinner. This Midianite woman emerges from the shadows of her father, who is a big-time high priest. And she emerges from the shadows of her husband, who is about to be the greatest leader of all time, the greatest emancipator of people. At this very moment is a shift in her life. Because now we see in the background, in the backdrop, a woman who seizes the moment. And I just want to talk for the next few minutes to any woman that knows there's about to be a shadow shift, that you're about to emerge from behind and you're about to stand in front. There's nothing wrong with being behind. There's nothing wrong with working on the backside. But God's about to give you an opportunity. And this opportunity is coming for you to shift out of the shadows. Glory to God. I want you to notice this. The first thing I need you to know, everything is centered around this one moment. Everything is centered around this one moment. What are you saying, Pastor? Don't freeze in a moment that requires immediate reaction, immediate action. Do not freeze in a moment that requires immediate action. Why, pastor? The ability to respond under pressure is currency for your promotion. You've got to be ready to move when something happens. You can no longer hide in the shadows and sit back as if you don't have the gift and sit back as if you don't know how to work that machine and sit back as if you don't know multiple languages. It is your time to be navigated to the front. Somebody shout shadow shift. 
Hey, glory to God. God was about to kill Moses. But she's in the background. But she's not in the back screaming. And she's not in the back freezing. She's not back there saying, oh my God, what she did, she began to respond. God can use the pressure you're under to produce a dependency upon him that will produce power for you. And power is the ability to do. And panic is an inability to access because unthinking behavior has crushed your ability to tap into your power. And I don't know who I'm talking to right now, but COVID-19 has taught all of us this year how to do what we didn't know what to do. It taught us how to find what we couldn't find. It taught us how to be creative when we didn't think it was there. It taught us how to collaborate. It taught us how to shift in and to shift out. It taught us how to find the contrast. Glory to his name. I want you to type on the line right now. It's in my hands. It's in, it's in my hands. It's in my hands. It's in my The second thing that I want to tell you is that she found what she needed in the stones. Can you see her? Moving things around. Moving stones of heartache. Moving stones of bad memories. Moving stones of pain. Oh, the truth be told, you can't move no stones like that. You got to get down to move a stone. What you need to do is move some stuff to find what you need. And some of you can't find it because you're too pretty. And some of you won't find it because you have an excuse. But on the backdrop of the east side, there's a woman that has no real name. There's a woman that's not mentioned in the Bible very much. But she's down on her knees searching for the stone. And I just want to know, can you find what you're looking for when you're under pressure? She's on the ground searching through the stones. Now, what makes this remarkable is the fact that God has said, I'm getting ready to kill Moses. So now she hears what's getting ready to happen to her husband. And she's on the ground trying to respond. But what she needs is in the stone. I wish I had a witness in here. Somebody right now, you need to know that what you need is in the stone. And the Bible tells me that they went to the grave and they rolled the stone away glory to God I don't know who I'm talking to but what you need is the rock that's on top of the rock wish I had a witness in here somebody say I need a stone Ooh, I feel the Holy Ghost right now I came here to tell you to find your edge because the text says that she needed a stone that was sharp, not a smooth stone. David needed a smooth stone, five smooth stones. But this woman of God, she didn't need five stones. She just needed to search through stones and find the stone that had an edge. And I came in here today to tell you, find your edge. Glory to God. Have I got a witness in here? You got to search through the past. You got to search through your feelings. You got to search through your emotions. You got to search through the fears. You got to search through being down. You got to search through the shame. You got to search through the pain. Find stone have I got a witness here type it on the line and say find your stone have I got a witness here can the church say yeah, yeah.
Here she is. She's going through the stones to find one that has an edge. And she finally finds one. Have I got a witness here? Look at somebody in your house and tell them you don't have time to be dull in 2020. You got to find your edge. Get your education. Find your edge. Go back to school and take some more courses. Find your edge. Whatever the gift you have, search deep down inside. Find. Somebody say it. What you're looking for is right under your feet. What you're looking for, you already have access to. So you don't have time to cry. Get your edge. You don't have time to pick up your phone and call nobody. Get your edge. You can't afford to go into 2021 without your edge. Your business has to get edgy. Your marriage has to get edgy. But what you need is within your reach. You don't have to go to the north. You don't have to go to the south. Look at somebody and tell them it's under my feet. It's in the stones. Stones represent structure. Stability, memorialization, and execution. Death. Structure stability. You can build on a rocky foundation. Memorializing. You can place a stone to remember what happened. And when you look at execution, this woman is finding a stone for herself. But in the New Testament, there were men that were finding a stone to kill her. Killing season is over. Nobody's coming after you because you got your edge. And if they happen to show up, what you need is under your feet. I wish I had a witness in here. We're getting ready to ride out of here, y'all. But when we ride out, we're gonna ride out strong. I need somebody to shout hallelujah. If I can get 2,000 women online right now to just say, it's in my hands. You're going to have to understand that making a mark is more important than making a name. See, who and what she was was never her issue. It's always somebody else's. Quit trying to explain your blessing to people. Quit trying to justify where you are where you are. Quit trying to dumb it down so they can feel good about your elevation. Quit worrying about where you live because you're, not, you, you, you're concerned about what they're going to think. What you are and who you are is not your issue. It's somebody else's. And let them have it. If you make the mark... The mark will make you a name. But if you try to make yourself a name without a mark, your name will be easily erased. But if you make it your mission to make your mark, the mark will set you up. I press toward the mark, glory to God, and the prize of the high calling. Making the mark. Why are you saying this, Pastor? Why all of this? Because this is the first time. The very first time that a woman circumcises a man. Abraham circumcised Isaac. Isaac circumcised Jacob. Jacob circumcised his sons. It was normal, it was customary, it was tradition for man to be circumcised on the eighth day of his life. 
God instituted it. I want him in covenant with me. And if you didn't put him in covenant, then it was difficult for God to embrace what he allowed you to be blessed with. So we see now for the very first time a woman doing what a man always does. I believe that we have tapped into something. We've got a woman running for vice president, something that a man has always done. We've got women owning businesses, making multi-millions of dollars and some that are billionaires, tapping into places where only men have been reserved. This is a season for you to shift out of your shadow and for you to find the contrast, for you to be opposite of what they've said you're going to be. This woman, you've got to see this woman. Taking the knife, cutting her own son. Can you hear him crying? Can you hear her crying? Moses is about to be killed, and Zipporah, the bird, flies in, takes the knife, puts it in her hands says that she took the knife and I believe that is prophetic that every woman that just watched what happened in this virtual conference you've been given the tools but now it's up to you to take the tools I came on here to tell you it's in your hands it's up to you to make it happen it's in your hands It's up to you to go back home. It's in your hands. It's up to you to walk on that job. It's in your hands. Woman, it's in your hands. So wherever you are right now, I came to prophesy to you. Pick up your bag. Pick up your mind. Pick up your smile. And let the devil know it's in my hands. My joy is in my head. My power is in my head. My victory is in my head. If you believe it, say yeah. She circumcises. She circumcises. Can you see her cutting the flesh? I'm almost done with it. You can't be what you want to be until you cut off what can't go with you. She circumcises her son. And the definition of circumcise is not just the cutting away but it's cutting all the way around. Part of the reason some of us are struggling because we cut part of the way. A partial cut. Piece of a cut. But to be circumcised, circle, circumcised, Mm -hmm. means I must cut around, remove, and leave behind. It is sad to say, but some of you love stuff so much that you're willing to cut and medicate, cut and bandage, cut and keep, and you wonder why your love life is infected, and you wonder why there's poison in you, because you didn't cut 
all the way around. And you have to remove it and leave it behind. But not only that, in the text, she takes what she cut off and she threw it at Moses' feet. And she gives a prophetic declaration. You are bloody husband. She's not talking about him. She's talking about the circumcision. And what she does is prophesy how a man is going to walk into the future with bloody stuff. This man, Moses, without Zipporah, without her hand, we don't have the hand of Moses that picks up the staff because God's going to kill him. But it took her hand because it always takes somebody else's hand to get you where you need to go. It will always take somebody else's hand to open up a door to the next dimension for you, softly. It will always take somebody else's hand to direct you into your future. It is in your hands. We don't get Moses throwing the serpent down. We don't get Moses taking the blood of the lamb and putting it over the doorpost and we don't get Moses stretching the rod across the Red Sea. We don't get Moses striking the rock. We don't get Moses speaking to the rock. We don't get Moses going up to the mountaintop. None of that happens from Moses if Zipporah doesn't fly in and put things in her hand. Use your hand. Your hand represents authority. Your hand represents generosity. Your hand represents hospitality. Your hand represents courage. Your hand is getting ready to provide for somebody that almost lost it. It, it is in your hands where you are right now. I want you to lift your hands because I believe you're getting ready to walk in this week with every tool that you need spiritually to take the world by force. Right now, come on, lift your hands, lift your hands, lift your hands, lift your hands, lift your hands. Come on, lift your hands because it's in your hands, it's in your hands, it's in your hands, it's in your hands. It's in your hands. It's in your hands. It's in your hands. Come on. I want to pray for you right now. It's in your hands. Yeah. It's in your hands. Come on, real big. Come on. Come on, shout it. It's in my hands. Oh, it's in my hands. Everything that you need, everything that you desire, it's in your hands. It's in my hands. Yeah. Yeah. It's in my hands. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. Reach out and get it. It's in my yeah. It's in my hands. That's it, church. Come on, come on. It's in my hands. Stay right there. I want to pray for you. You can call. 1-800-BISHOP-2, we're getting ready to pray for you right now because it's in your hands.
but you got to move from conflict to contrast you got to find it it's in your hands reach down under your feet that edge is right there and I want you to begin to pray for each other online I love how we corporately pray we're gonna go here for a few seconds and I want you to begin to list the things that you need in your hands some of you need a house in your hands yeah some of you need healing in your hands and I want you to pray right now it's in your hands come on 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 I'm looking for you I'm looking for you whatever you need God to do I want you to put it say I need this in my hand come on come on come on come on come on I need my healing in my hands I need a job in my hands come on come on come on come on come on come on yeah somebody said forgiveness I need a house I need direction I need finances come on I need strength I need wisdom and knowledge blessings in my marriage Come on, peace in my hands, resources made, jobs, joy. I need healing. I need keys in my hands. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Deliverance in my hands. That's it. Keep it coming, keep it coming, keep it coming, keep it coming, keep it. It's in my hands. Yes, Lord. It's in my hands. Yeah, come on, come on, it's in my hand, yeah, 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 in my hand, It's in your hands. It's in your hands. It's in your hands. Father, I thank you for every request that is scrolling up and down the screens right now. That Father, we believe in you. We believe who you are. And we're going to put our hands out in faith and grab hold of the promises of God. Healing is in my hands. My job is in my hands. My joy is in my hands. My family is in my hands. My peace is in my hands. Everything that I need is in my hands. Now, Father, we give you glory and we give you praise and we bless your holy name. If you believe it, now put your hands together and give him glory right now. Come on. Yeah! 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 It's in my Those of you who came on after we had the opportunity to sow, I want you to sow into this anointing right now. And if you already have sown and God is tugging on your heart, I want you to sow a $33 seed right now into the kingdom. I'm sowing it. My wife is sowing it because I believe that God give seed to the sower. And we're sowing the number 33 today. And we believe in God for harvest. I'm believing God for a harvest. The information is on the screen for you to know how to give, for how to pay your tithes. There's three ways for you to do it. And what I want you to do is give right now. Sow a sacrificial seed right now. We know that this is good grounds. And when we give, it doesn't leave our life. Glory to God, it just leaves our hands. 
we put seed in the ground. Well, I tell you what, I have enjoyed you today. Make sure you log on Wednesday night. Dr. James will have a word from you. But our post show is coming on the way.